You take a guy and you show him the picture of someone of the opposite sex, if he is heterosexual, and you show him the picture of this individual, and if it is someone who he assesses as being attractive, you don't necessarily get this dopaminergic pathway to activate. It depends. What this study showed was if the person is making what would pass for eye contact, if they are looking straight out, the dopamine system activates. And if they're looking elsewhere, it doesn't activate. How's that for classic male sort of responsiveness? If it looks as if this attractive person is looking at you, it activates. Even more distressingly from this study, when you show men, on the average blah blah, pictures of women who they would rate as being unattractive, it's when they're looking away that the dopamine system activates. Oh my god, what is going on here? This is pitiful. What also has been shown is the exact same eye contact phenomenon of gay men looking at pictures of attractive men. Another theme we're going to see over and over, which is sexual orientation being pretty much trivial in terms of how it influences some of this neurobiology. Just switch the gender of the other individual and it works exactly the same. Now when you look at this business about dopamine rising in anticipation of a reward rather than in response to the reward itself, it brings up one of the, it doesn't bring that up, it brings up one of the all-time interesting studies that was published about a decade ago. Okay, so the paradigm I described last week, you put on the light which tells the monkey that okay, we're starting one of those sessions where if you press the levers adequately, you will get a reward. And they now carry out this behavior. And as a result, they get the reward here. And as we saw, dopamine doesn't go up after the reward. It goes up at this point. This is the, I know how to do this. This is gonna be great. This is terrific. Here's where you get the rise in dopamine. This is not only the anticipation, but if you don't have this rise, you don't get the behavior, the goal-directed behavior. Now, in this brilliant study, what they did was transition from a paradigm where, okay, the monkey presses the lever 10 times and gets the reward. Now what you do is the monkey works and it gets the reward only half the time it gets only a 50% reward rate, reward rate unpredictably. And what happens to dopamine? Okay, got your choice. What's your vote? It doesn't rise as much. It rises the exact same amount. It rises even higher. Okay, you guys all understand anticipation and gold. It does this. It's one of the biggest rises you will find in dopamine in the brain short of cocaine. What have you just introduced into there? This is, I'm all over it. I know how this works. This is going to be great. I have mastery and control. I am the captain of my own lever pressing. This is all about that. What's this about? This is what dopamine does when you have introduced the word maybe into the equation. And that is incredibly reinforcing. And people will work like mad in contexts of maybe far more so than when they work in contexts of certainty. Psychologists have known this forever. This is intermittent reinforcement. You never get more behavior out of an organism than when you have introduced a maybe into it. And part of the brilliance of this study was what they then did. Now animals either got reward 25% of the time or 75% of the time. On a certain level, these are diametrically opposite manipulations. In one, you're getting more rewards. In the other, you're getting less. What's the thing they have in common? They both had smaller maybes than the 50% version. And what you see is it would look like this, 100%. 25 or 75, 50% maximizing the maybe. And one of the most brilliant things that various social engineers do with humans is convince people that there's a 50% maybe when it is not 50% in the slightest. That's what Las Vegas is about. That's an entire world of very smart psychologists making people think in circumstances where there's like one-tenth of one percent of a maybe going on there that is actually a 50%. And when you do that, you get dopamine like crazy and you get goal-directed behavior as a result. Really, really powerful.
And this is so strongly the case that this explains an extremely cynical uh, thing that a guy I knew in my dorm back when used to say all the time, how's this for like a dispirited view of what life is like, but possibly absolutely accurate, which is a relationship is the price you pay for the anticipation of it. How's that for a grim world view? Go figure, this guy had what a string of disastrous relationships, but what you see here is introduce a maybe, and it is very, very powerful. One final piece of the dopamine system here that is pertinent, which is, as you might expect from all of our molecular biology stuff, there's all sorts of different dopamine receptor subtypes. And two of them are pertinent to this world of sexual behavior and reward, what is called the shockingly the D1 dopamine receptor and the D2 dopamine receptor. And what studies show is in monogamous species, what happens is right after mating, when a pair bond is first formed, the second that's over with, levels of the D2 receptor go way down, you down-regulate the levels of the receptor, and you up-regulate the levels of the D1 receptor. What's that about? If you drive down the D2 levels before they even mate, they don't form a pair bond. If you prevent the decline in the D2s after they've mated and pair bonded, or if you prevent the rise in the D1s, They'll pair bond, and then eight and a half minutes later, they'll go and pair bond with somebody else. The D2s seem to mediate the rewarding anticipatory aspects of pair bonding. The D1s on a certain rodential level seem to mediate the pleasure of the monogamous, the truly monogamous features of the pair bond. So very interesting interaction between the two. Okay, one last thing now about dopamine, and this one is like even more depressing than relationships or the price you pay. This was a study which was really like someday may come to haunt you majorly. And in this study, what they did, it was another one of those brain imaging study ones. And what they did was they took people in two categories. In both cases, these are people who had found their beloved. Their beloved, the person who was their soulmate, the person in whose arms they were going to die someday, the person. And they divided it between these two groups. One was a group where they had known the person in whose arms they're going to die for like two and a half weeks. And the other is when they had been together for more than five years. So you, pick, you put somebody in the brain scanner and you start flashing up at speed, subliminal speeds of pictures of individuals they know, important control in the study, and embedded in there is a picture of their beloved and suddenly somewhere along the way up flashes the picture of their beloved, be in a short-term relationship and the dopamine system goes crazy and activates like mad. Now you come back five years later into that same relationship with the beloved and you do the exact same thing and you flash up their picture and the dopamine system doesn't activate. What activates instead was that anterior cingulate thing we heard about on Friday having to do with empathy and comfort and all of that. In other words, what we see here is the neurochemical transition from one's beloved from causing like your blood to run scalding hot to your beloved being like a comfortable old armchair. This is one depressing study. So let's take a five-minute break to contemplate that one. Okay, and then we will resume.